Welcome to Coaching Uncaged, the podcast on all things coaching, brought to you by Animas. And now introducing your host, Yannick Jacob. Simon Weston, welcome to the podcast. Very nice to be here, Yannick. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I should I should say welcome back to the podcast. It's uh, it's not often that we have to people coming back uh, just because there's so many interesting minds out there. Uh, but when I when I listened to uh, your your uh, interview with Rob uh, a couple of years ago now, mm-hmm. um, there was uh, so many threads in there. That I would have loved to pick you up on or go a little bit deeper. So if anybody listens to this, feel free to go back. Uh, you also tell a little bit of your story. Maybe just shortly, uh, you have you had an illustrious career. Uh, you've worked with the dying. You've worked as a family therapist. Uh, you've worked in a lot of organizations. Uh, you are the uh, founder of the uh, what was it? The leadership, the Eco Leadership Institute. So there's a systemic angle that I really appreciate. Um, uh, Rob did one of your courses. My wife did one of your uh, trainings as well, and really appreciated the the systemic lens, uh, particularly around networks. Yeah. Um, and uh, you might have to help me out with it. You're the former president of the International Society for the Psychoanalytic Study of Organizations. Yeah, yeah, ISPSO. It's um, an international body and uh, it's really bringing psychoanalytic uh, thinking and systemic thinking into organizations. And we have some of the kind of top scholars and practitioners in, in the field. So it's, a, it's like a think tank for, uh, for our work. So it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's a great privilege to be um, president of uh that for a couple of years and I really enjoyed it yeah Mm -hmm. it's fascinating work and definitely something I want to deepen our conversation around uh, that psychoanalytic influence working with the unconscious in coaching um, really really important I think for us to develop an awareness about whereas many coaches don't they're just like that's that psychoanalysis, that's therapeutic stuff. I, I don't really want to go there. So it would be lovely to explore how that can serve coaches. And also I want to mention your uh, uh, just the, the Coaching and Mentoring, a Critical Text, uh, was one of those books that, that offered so much depth and so many questions, just a, a critical perspective, but in the most positive sense of that word. Um, so I'd love to dive in a little bit deeper on why it's important for us to be critical, uh, which is an important voice, I think, in the coaching field, whereas many coaches are uh, much more in the positive, not really wanting to challenge or finding it uncomfortable to challenge and be the voice of critique. Yeah. Um, so thank you for, for that work. Pleasure. Anything you would kind of throw in there that, that might be helpful for people to understand where you're talking from? Um, I won't go through my whole kind of biography of career, but my work comes from experience. I think all our work is autobiographical in, in a way. You know, we, we, we can't fail to bring ourselves, our, our social, our histories, our, our backgrounds into the work with us. So as you said, I've worked, I worked in a factory. I worked as a general nurse. I worked with the dying and with the sick. I worked in uh, elderly care. I worked in mental health asylums. I worked with psychotic and schizophrenic patients. And all this kind of experience is... Um, what surprises me is like uh, that was a long time ago. I don't know, but it's uh, it stays very fresh with me. It's like you know, it's still kind of there. I, I kind of embodied that work. It was very uh, mm-hmm. important. And then I moved into family therapy, moved into academia, moved into consultancy, moved into coaching. But there's a tra- trajectory which I think is important. And and I, I tell people a story, and I say that uh, my first work was with the body in a factory. It was manual labor. You brought your body to work. People weren't interested in whether you were passionate about your work or enjoying your work. You brought your body to work. It's physical labor. In nursing, it was all about the body. It was mm-hmm. general nursing. It was very much about kind of uh, the fragile body, the dying body, the resilient body. And, and you, I think as a nurse, you get closer to the human body than any other kind of profession, really. You know, you really kind mm-hmm. of, you, you work so closely with the body. And then, uh, and then I got interested in psychiatry and psychology. So you start working with the mind. So I moved from the body to the mind. I did uh, a degree in counseling. I started working with individuals and psychotherapy. And, um, and then I, I, I realized that the, the individual and the mind, you know, we're, we're, we're always connected. So I, I said this family therapy because I was working with young people, teenagers, like suicidal teenagers, um, anorexic teenagers. Now it mostly disturbed young people and it was um, challenging work, very rewarding work. 
but you could never kind of work with them as individual. You had to work with, them with as as individuals and do kind of a support work and coaching work and psychotherapy with them. But you always have to connect it to the family and to the wider system, to the school. Um, and often they present with a problem. It wasn't they weren't actually the problem. They were a hmm. symptom of a wider problem. Mm-hmm. So, so that kind of a movement from the body, mind, individual, family system, team system. Yeah. And then I got interested in kind of organizational consultancy and how whole organizations and, and later my work in, in uh, leadership and coaching, I, I'm very much of a psychosocial, I, I take a social perspective. So when yeah. I wrote my book on leadership, it was very much about trying to understand how society impacts on organizations. Mm-hmm. So when you go from body to the mind, to the individual, to the social group, to wider society. And I, I think these links are important. I think in coaching, we too often just get hooked on the individual and on the mm-hmm. mind. So I think yeah. remembering the body, remembering the system is kind of really important. So just to say that that informs my work, really. Yeah, thank you. There's, there's so many points I could pick you up on, but just kind of to appreciate the the journey of maturing as a coach, of maybe not maturing, but developing as a coach. Mm-hmm. You started from the body. Uh, many coaches start from there, but I think many more start from the cognitive element of mm-hmm. helping somebody think, problem solving, uh, performance, and uh, how do you bring the body into your work nowadays? I can I can see how they all come together. Um, I, I wonder to, in, especially in organizations, um, often there's an emphasis on quite heady problem solving. Uh, even the systemic element is often um, not really embodied when I talk to about clients. We have to actively bring that in. So I wonder how that looks like for you in practice. It works in two ways, really. One way is I use my own body as a, I mean, people think about the unconscious as they have kind of this old fashioned idea of the unconscious being like this iceberg with like, you know, the, the unconscious beneath the surface. And I, I think about the, um, I, I take more of a Lacanian psychoanalytic view these days and, and the unconscious is the speaking body in a sense. You know, we carry the unconscious in our body, our, our affects, our kind of feelings, our emotions what we call the counter-transference in coaching, you know, what we pick up from the clients, the emotions we pick up, you know. So I experience my clients in, in a physical way and I experience my own emotions in a physical way. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the data I use as a coach. And then the other... Could I, the other sorry, could I, could I jump in there quickly? Just yeah. because uh, you mentioned a couple of terms that people might not be familiar with. Um, uh, could you give us an example, perhaps, to make this more tangible? How how do you pick up something from your body in relation to the client? Uh, you know, the counter-transference is quite a technical term. Can we can we make that alive? Yeah, I mean, basically, you're, you're when you're trained in, 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 in psychoanalysis, you you actually think about the uh, what the client projects on, on, onto you. So you kind of you read your own emotions, you read your own, you get experience into kind of reading your own emotions and, and your own feelings and kind of making sense of it. So, you know, I might be feeling angry, but um, I, I check out whether I'm feeling angry because I'm feeling angry or because whether the client is maybe being very passive aggressive in a session. You know? mm-hmm. So you're checking out your own experience and, and you use supervision and, and, you, and you get very kind of aware of your own experience. And then you feel something in the session which isn't yours. It's mm-hmm. actually something which is happening between you or comes from the client. And you check it out with the client. You don't interpret the client, but you check it out and you say, you know, I'm actually feeling very angry in, in, in my body at the moment, but I don't know where it's coming from. Are you feeling angry at the moment? Is, is there, and and there's, if you've got a lot of trust, they'll stop and they'll think and they'll say, I am actually, I've been, I've been, I've been furious this week and I've been carrying this and, and now you've mentioned it. Like I, I hadn't thought, thought about it, but actually, yeah, I've been really furious at like my, my boss or something happened mm-hmm. in my family. And mm-hmm. so you're picking up kind of this and you're playing it back to the, back to the client. So you're kind of feeling something or feeling some discomfort or some anxiety. And you, you check out whether, you know, you might've had a kind of a big row with your partner or something back, back home. And you, but if it's not your own anger, if it's something else or some anxiety, you check out with a client what that's about. And often it reveals kind of a, a much deeper kind of place, something they're not aware of, something in their unconscious mm-hmm. which they've been carrying in their bodies. So you kind of use your body as, 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 as a tool in the sense, as a sensor mm-hmm. to kind of work out what's happening. Yeah, and that's why it's so important that we do our own work as coaches if we choose yeah. to work in this way, because uh, we need to make the distinction between this is stuff for, that happened to me earlier or last week, or it's still kind of floating around. And, oh, here, this this part of what's happening in my body or what I'm feeling um, is actually as a result of the relationship that I'm in right now with this client. That's right. And, you and you know, the, the more experience you get, the kind of more 
more aware you are of that and you uh but always check it out it's like you know in, in psychoanalysis the, the analyst might make an interpretation but we don't do that so much in coaching we just check out we, we have a conversation with people and say you know are you feeling this you know uh, is this something present in you you know what's happening you know and you might get like no i'm not feeling angry but i have i actually feel very sad you know they start crying and they say actually i'm carrying a lot of sadness you know but the the anger was like a defense you know they were they were kind of putting up a kind of a brave face mm-hmm. holding on to something so you often like even if you don't kind of uh, get it right first time it's a way of exploring what's happening and it kind of opens yeah. up and, and that's something for the client yeah yeah oh, that's great um can we stay with psychoanalysis for a, a bit longer? Because uh, um, some people may know my my wife is a Lacanian psychoanalyst, and uh, she's yeah, she's she's emphasizing the Lacanian quite a lot, even though she's a big a big uh, fan of Freud's ideas because he's he's done so much for uh, explorers of the mind and understanding the human psyche. Um, but there are some distinctions, and while we don't need to get perhaps too technical. Um, I would love you to speak a bit about how psychoanalysis influenced your work, why Lacanian particularly, and perhaps going into how how can we work with the unconscious in coaching? Why why does it matter that we're aware of it? And how does that work? Big questions, I know. <laughs> yeah, big questions. Where to start? I mean, I I started off um, becoming interested in psychoanalysis because it became very clear to me that rational explanations of the world weren't enough. You know, so like, you know, you, you could actually observe unconscious processes in groups and in individuals. And when you become familiar with it, like, you, you know, you observe it in yourself, you know, you, you've got a very stressful meeting a, a ahead of you and you forget the time of the meeting because you actually don't want to be there, you know. So you, you start <laughs> seeing your own patterns and your own repetitions in, in your life around things you've avoided or, or your defenses and you start learning about yourself. So, I mean, you know, processing my own life, you know, I've, I've had kind of a, I won't go into my personal life, but I've had, I've suffered great losses in my life, you know, sort of family mm-hmm. losses and things. And um, just how you process that, how you kind of uh, understand that and what your unconscious does, you know. And, and for me, if, if it stays repressed, you, you act out in different ways. So psychoanalysis is really kind of a, a way, I think, of, of working with things we're not always aware of and things we repress. And if we repress something in, in our lives, it's actually a, a weight we carry around with us and we can act out very dysfunctionally. You know, we, we can be avoiding that kind of uh, the pain we're holding or some of the issues we're carrying with us. Um, and then as a coach, I think, you know, if you're going to do deep coaching work, you know, not all coaching work kind of works like this, but if you're going to do deep coaching work, you need to kind of um, have some access to the unconscious. You know, you have to have some access as, as to what's being repressed and some understanding of these, these kind of processes of projection, of counter-transference, of what happens in that relationship between you and the client. So I don't know, I learned it as a therapist. I learned it in my own life, being on the couch, you know, I'm... I'm spending time in analysis uh, as a way of understanding myself. One of the challenges and one of the things, reasons why psychoanalysis is not so popular in coaching, I think, is because coaching often kind of veers towards the positive um, and therapy often veers towards a patholo- pathologizing kind of stance. So in my coaching book, I write about the, uh, the wounded self and the celebrated self. Mm-hmm. I love that terminology, by the way. And therapists often, kind of like, you know, we're trained to pick up the wounded self. That's what we do. You know, we heal people. We kind of, you know, you're there to kind of uh, pick up the, the, the wounds, the kind of the, the injuries, the repressions. And, you're, you know, people come to you because they, they're carrying some problems, some dysfunction, some, some thing they're anxiety, they're concerned about, something in their life they're not happy about. So as a therapist, your, your job is to really kind of work with the wounded self and do reparation work, do healing work. Whereas a coach, it's a bit different. You might have to do some of that work, but you also want to be focusing on their strengths and their abilities and how they can. Mm. It's more of a developmental kind of role. So, so you you have to do both. And in, in analytic network coaching, our training, we start right at the beginning and say you have you know we bridge between the wounded self and a celebrated self. Mm-hmm. And I I talk to uh, you know I attract quite a lot of therapists who become coaches, and they often kind of veer a bit too much on the wounded self, and I'm like whoa you know breaks on. Look at the resilience in this client. Mm-hmm. Look at the strength in this client as well. Don't just go to the pathology. Don't just go to the, you know. So psychoanalysis is, is kind of, I and, and I, I think problematic in that sense that it kind of often veers towards defenses and pathology. 
Mm-hmm. The nice thing, I, the, the reason I got attracted to Lacan is because he's, he talks a lot about enjoyment, about jouissance in French, mm-hmm. about pleasure, about desire. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, not, um, I'm not trained as a, a Lacanian analyst, uh, but I'm interested and I read and I go to, I go to classes and, uh, and uh, it's really transformed my work because it kind of, uh, now, now I look at situations in organizations and in clients and I'm thinking about how people enjoy, not just their defenses. I'm thinking about kind of uh, their desires. You know? So in analytics network coaching, one of our first questions in the depth analysis frame is what is your desire? Mm-hmm. And we start exploring this, you know, and, and it's a very complicated question. It's sort of uh, clients look at you and what? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we explore you ask the question in those words. You, yeah, you yeah, ask them, yeah. what is your desire? Oh, wow. Yeah. Not, <laughs> I mean, not always like, you know, you have to be culturally sensitive, like, you know, in, in ah, yeah. situations. But um, often, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of started that place, you know, and, and and they look at you bemused and they say, what do you mean? And I shrug and I look at them again and then they and we start exploring <laughs> that and it's uh, and it becomes very interesting, you, you know, and you return to it over, over the sessions and we think about, like Lacan always says, our desires are always a desire of the other. You know, so we, we have parents in our lives who desire things for us. We have society who tells us we should be this or we should mm-hmm. be that. Now. So we're, it's your relationship to desire rather than you're just you're, you're carrying this kind of innate desire. We have a relationship to how desire shaped us, you know, and, and it yeah. can be a real breakthrough for clients because they, they've they been following this desire. You know, oh, I want a successful career. I want to earn a lot of money. And they well, actually you pull that apart. And it's like, yeah, that came from my parents who were poor and they wanted, you know, and, and they, they, they wanted this for me. And you can free people up from these kind of like patterns and they can mm. actually then discover their own true desire, you know. So. Getting much closer. I mean, if you ask, what do you want? You know, often there is a preconceived answer or no answer. Um, yeah. And like chipping away at what's coming from the outside, uh, which we're so inherently shaped by, you know, sure. just by, and, and that's what Lacan often like, explored in depth at how as babies we start identifying through the other and we see yeah. our ourselves through the other uh, you know the mom in the mirror points at you and says that's you but the baby sees the mom pointing at you and you know so we always we always carry that and but that's that's quite a quite a therapeutic journey as such i'm not sure i don't like the label right because the boundaries get very blurred here um so i wonder how you understand uh, the gray space and the lines between the practices. I mean, you, you have backgrounds in both practices. So for you, it's safer to work across the board and it, you might not even be interested in where the line is because you can go a lot deeper with clients. Um, but you also train coaches. So I, I wonder I wonder what you think about these things. I mean, I, I think, I, I don't think we can separate coaching from therapy because like you know, in, in the coaching I mentioned book I wrote, it's like you, 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 you you draw a journey and there's a genealogy, there's a, there's a family history of kind of where coaching came from and it comes, you know, coaching, counseling, therapy, psychoanalysis, spiritual direction before that, you know, there's mm-hmm. been pairing, helping, helping relationships throughout history mm-hmm. and they show up in, in different ways. And, and coaching is kind of one of these talking cures, one of the, you know, two people sitting in a room together, uh, talking about their issues, their challenges, their, their desires, um, so it's got this kind of history and this linkage. And I mean, the two differences I make, one is therapy is very much about the wounded self and coaching bridges both the wounded and the celebrated self. Like if you're just a positive coach and you refuse to look at the shadow side, you're in trouble. If you're just a therapist and you refuse to look at the, 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 the positive side, you're in trouble. You know, so it's mm-hmm. about it, the professions about those two things. And the, the other difference is, which it might be different way of coaching I, I my coaching work is always about work so it's always executive coaching leadership coaching organizational coaching which might be different anonymous where you're more you know you have a life coaching um piece as well but in the work work becomes an anchor so if i'm working with a client and when i'm training coaches i talk about work being an anchor so we, we can talk about your past and your history and your family only if it helps us give you information about your current, your present state at work. So mm-hmm. if you have issues of, with authority, with your father, I always bring it back, you know, how does that show up in the boardroom? How does mm-hmm. that show up in the workplace? So work becomes like an anchor and it, it rescues you from just going down a the therapeutic journey. Right. So the, there's a big difference in that there's an anchor point 
to this yeah. work. We're referring to what did you come in with? What was the desire? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the context in which you want to navigate something or move forward or move through something or explore it? Um, yeah. And, and a, a therapist wouldn't do that. No, that's right. So it's more systemic. You're thinking more about the kind of organizational context. You're thinking about kind of a, how it shows up work. And it's actually, it's a safety valve. It's like a, a container for the client. So they know that you're going to, when they know you're going to bring it back to work, they kind of feel safer to kind of do some of that other exploration, knowing that you're not going to get lost into kind of some big journey into kind of their, mm -hmm. their kind of uh, dilemmas or problems, you know. You can use it as a material to help them understand themselves in the present context, but the context is where organizations, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, of course it spills over people go come back to me and say that coaching just changed my the way i i operate my family you know so there's, there's a kind of a, a spillover but your focus is on work as i'm focusing between the wounded and, and the celebrated self not just the wounded self that's the mm -hmm. kind of the anchor points i have yeah that makes a lot of sense um i wonder where to go next um maybe since you mentioned systems just now and you mentioned you've been a very family therapist as well And in the context of the psychoanalytic frame, um, you've heard of IFS, internal family systems, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. um, Richard Schwartz's work, where there isn't one self, there's multiple selves, and there is a system inside of us, uh, which he kind of derived from systems that existed outside within families. Um, the psychoanalytic stance is not a fan of multiple selves. There's a different psychic apparatus. So I've I wonder if you, uh, what, what do you think about that kind of system? Because many coaches kind of get into that and they seem very excited about it. Um, and I, I just wanted to to be curious about um, what your stance towards it is and perhaps just to flesh out uh, some of the framework or how it's different or how it's the same. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's a little bit too transactional. It's like... Uh, you have these multiple selves and you start naming these selves. And uh, I do think we have, you know, we're, we're plural kind of, uh, we're messy and we're plural. And I, I, I veer away from the idea that we have a kind of, a, some coaches think about the idea that if you peel off the skin of the onion, you have a pure self, like a, a, an inherent kind of pure untainted self, which you, if you get back to that, then the whole world looks glossy and, and nice. You know? So I, I don't kind of follow that, that line of thinking. But when you start to talk about multiple selves, I think it's uh, it's just problematic for me. I, I think it's a bit too transactional. You're trying to kind of box it into categories of types of selves, and I just think there's too it's too, you know the, the self is too fluid for that. The way we use psychodynamic systems is we think about how we carry things on behalf of others. So you know, in in family therapy. I mean, an example is, I give you a family therapy example, which I, I, I teach on my coaching course. I had a 13-year-old lad come to me in, uh, when I was working in Liverpool, and he'd been uh, labeled as a school refuser and uh, school phobic, high anxiety. Mm -hmm. So he goes to a cognitive behavioral therapist, and they do a lot of anxiety kind of uh, training with him and managing anxiety. That doesn't work. He goes to the, the doctor, they give him anxiety medications, That doesn't work. He comes to family therapy and, and we, we bring his family there and uh, everybody comes except for the father. And after building up some trust with the family, doing some work, we realize that the, the boy is staying at home in school, not because he's phobic, because he's protecting his mother from a violent father. Mm -hmm. So this poor lad has been kind of like treated, kind of trained because everyone just has this individual focus and nobody yeah. asks a systemic question. So, you know, we reframe it. We say how helpful he's been to his mother by bringing them to, to therapy so that we can then, then do this deeper work and, mm. uh, and the systemic work. And I use that example and, and translate it to the, the workplace. So when you're coaching somebody, you know, never never believe the first, uh, never take what they say in the first instance as, 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 uh, as reality because unconsciously or consciously they might be bringing um, something on behalf of the wider system. Mm -hmm. so when they blame the boss or they, there's this bad per person in the team if you get rid of that bad person in the team someone else pops up as a bad person because that bad person is holding something on behalf of the wider team mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so and that team you know <coughs> might, might be holding something on behalf of the wider organization so we think about kind of connected systems and independent systems and how unconsciously people hold things on behalf of others so 
in a team you'll get people kind of uh being the clever one or the the, the, the jokey one you know and that they hold anxiety on behalf of the rest of the team so we kind of use psychoanalysis uh, in a systemic way um in that way rather than kind of thinking about it as an internal kind of like a multiple self or, or something it's a, a different way of thinking about it yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense thank you um on that systemic lens um I've heard you talk in your conversation with Rob, I think it was the one with Rob, uh, that part of the motivation to get into coaching was that you saw a system that wasn't working in healthcare um, with a with a, um, a desire to uh, to understand the system or maybe change the system. Um, eco leadership, you know, there's there's uh, there's big systemic issues that we're facing as a species at the moment. Yeah. And I know a lot of coaches uh, are super well intentioned and really want to make a difference, um, a systemic difference, working with people who might be able to make a systemic change or influence it in some way. Um, given that you had that kind of desire to, to go and explore that, I always grappled with this challenge of coaching being, um, well, coaching being, I, I say that as if it was the truth in a non-regulated profession, uh, but often most coaching schools, especially um, uh, related to the, or as part of the professional bodies of following uh, frameworks of the ICF or ACEMCC, it's something non-directive. It's where the coach doesn't come in with an agenda. However, it's it's difficult not to have an agenda if there is one. So um, I, I find it, I find a lot of coaches find it very challenging to be confronted with, do I follow my client? Am I, do I want to work client-led, but also I have an agenda that I notice? Um, mm -hmm. so could you talk a little bit about how you see that? Because uh, I heard you say some really interesting things around how we can never really be unbiased. Um, is it important that we bracket all of our biases and agendas and really work client-led? Or is it okay to come in and say, I want to make a difference uh, around the topic of climate change and maybe I'm going to pick my clients very carefully or maybe even I'm going to try to convince a client to do the right thing here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's a few issues you're, you're raising there. And one, I, I, I argue very strongly that um, I hear coaches and therapists and psychologists and people saying we take a neutral stance or we take a systemic stance and we can't choose sides and I'm like, there's no neutral stance. There's no such thing as a neutral stance. You know, forget that because, you know, that's kind of like, oh, that was an old fashioned way of thinking about science as well. People thought about science as Newtonian and you, you're, you're a neutral observer. You get into quantum physics and people realize that, you know, just by observing, you make a difference. You know? mm -hmm. So every one of us kind of makes a difference whether we're observing, whether we're coaching, you know, we're not neutral. You know, I, I can't, my body speaks a lot. You know, I'm a white man, you know, I go into a room, it has an influence. You know, mm -hmm. the way I've, my, my accent, my regional accent from Bristol, my kind of, you know, class accent, people, 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 people kind of pick things up, you know, my age, my ability, you know, people kind of pick things up about you, you're not neutral, you know, you're, you're present, you know, and then there's a whole training, you know, the, like the whole idea of coaching is not neutral, it's like, you know, a Western idea of individualism around kind of like individual choice and freedom, there's, mm -hmm. there's a whole package of ideas around coaching, the therapeutic culture kind of, uh, Which, which is part of it, which is not neutral. So if you go and coach Chinese people, which I have done, and you know people in different different cultures, then then you bump into kind of a difference, and you have to be aware of what you're bringing. You know, you're not you're not kind of just a blank sheet. So there's there's no neutrality, but that doesn't mean you have to come in with a kind of a strong opinion and say like, you know, we all must be kind of green, or we all must be kind of uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's no being aware of your biases, being aware of the social cultural kind of background you have being aware of the way you've trained being aware of your sort of uh having that kind of self-awareness is very helpful you know because then then you can dialogue with people about about that difference and you can kind of uh explore that and, and that can help them explore their own identities their own cultural kind of backgrounds their own kind of belief systems you know mm -hmm. so there's that part of it there's, there's no neutrality you know but it doesn't mean you have to kind of be kind of strongly opinioned or kind of directive you know I do, I do uh, believe that coaches have to take an ethical stance. I wrote a, an essay about the war in, um, in uh, Ukraine, you know, and, and it went a bit viral because I, I challenged psychologists and systemic thinkers to take a stance. You couldn't just kind of say we're neutral or we're systemic. You know, this was a, a, a 
terrible, terrible kind of unnecessary war. And like, you know, and, and the systemic repercussions of it are, are going to be immense, you know. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean when you go into with a client, you're going to impose your views on them. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I see myself as a sort of anthropologist in an organization. I see myself as, as a as a person who's very curious. You have to hold on to your curiosity. curiosity you know? mm-hmm. But there are times you have to take an ethical stance, you know, outside your practice, um, you know, on my Ecolegiate website, we talk about kind of the environment is important. You know, we, we can't ignore yeah. that, you know, it's no good kind of just doing one-to-one coaching, burying our heads thinking we're kind of, uh, we're going to be okay because we're neutral. That doesn't yeah. stop that. The climate change is still going on, you know, we have to kind of like try and be aware of that and, and try and kind of work towards those, those goals. So there, yeah. there's a balance, but it doesn't mean you have to kind of push your views on another but I think we have to take a, an, an ethical stance and, and be ethical beings and, and not kind of claim some neutrality and, you know, and uh, which we don't actually have. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's even more complicated because we're living in such a much more transparent world. Um, it was much easier as a therapist and many therapists are still very, very careful not to show who they are outside in their work. Uh, you won't find them on social media or writing blog posts or doing podcasts. Um, because what they work with is what's being projected onto them. And I understand that way of working, you know, um, you cannot work with this position anymore as soon as you show up and you share your values and your beliefs and your perspective. Um, and that's also a very valuable way of working. So I don't think there's a necessarily a better or worse one, but it's just a very different way of working and increasingly difficult not to be seen um, with your human elements well, you know, can't just be this neutral blank canvas. You that... never were. There, there's a, there's a, there's a. I think there's a, a mystery and a mystique about that. I mean, Freud kind of sat behind the couch to try and create this neutral thing, but you know, he was a kind of a powerful man in Vienna, and it's no wonder he got a lot of projections about the father. You know, it's not. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's not. You know, it's it, it, there is there is no neutrality, and, and you can certainly uh, attempt to be a, as much of a blank screen as you, as you want, but. You know, the whole practice, you know, in New York, the whole practice of kind of psychoanalysis is kind of like, you know, it's it's elitist, it's esteemed, you know, it, you have to kind of have enough money to go four times a week on the couch. You have to, there's a whole kind of package around it, which actually says, actually, this is not a kind of a, a neutral practice. This is an elite practice. It has a certain way of being. It's kind of uh, controlled by certain bodies of people. There's power struggles over, you know, there's all these splits in psychoanalysis about who who's the best psychoanalysis practice and who's got the truth of the unconscious and stuff, you know. So mm. I, I don't buy this the kind of neutrality. I understand I understand the way of working that you try and take a, a stance which is um allows the projections to come, but I, I really don't I, mm. I really think that and I actually think that that type of psychoanalysis is dying, it's dying very, very quickly. Mm. You know, psychoanalysis in America is like being usurped by cognitive behavioral therapists by all the other kind of therapists and i think be- because it's actually um yeah it's, it's problematic in, in our day and age i, mm-hmm. I don't think it's actually kind of working anymore where you see psychoanalysis growing like in the canadian fields in, in europe and, and beyond that there's a lot of growth there a lot of energy there they're taking a kind of different way of working a more flexible way of working you know they, they mm-hmm. kind of is is uh, and they, they they make more social commentary. Mm. They, well, yeah, yeah. The the existentialist in me uh, immediately responsibility pops up here. Uh, the more we bring ourselves into the coaching relationship, um, when we take an ethical stance, uh, we take a lot of responsibility, right? The responsibility grows because we're bringing something in that is potentially quite powerful. Uh, and talking about power, um, if we don't meet our clients at eye level or if they maybe admire us or idolize us or regard us as some sort of expert, um, whatever we say is going to have more weight if we're not very careful with uh, navigating those kind of dynamics. Um so how, how much responsibility is it important to take? And perhaps rather than have an abstract conversation about this, I wonder if you could tell us about a recent example, maybe from your coaching where you did take a stance or you shared uh, an opinion or you, you may have even urged somebody or just shared a different angle. Um, how, did, how can that play out in practice? So power, you know, Power analysis is part of what we do in this network coaching. We do, we do a network analysis and we analyze power in networks. And, uh, you know, it's interesting if, if you, I'm very interested, if I'm going to help a leader understand their kind of power and how they use power, 
then it's the the coaching um, setup is quite an interesting place to explore that, you know. So who has a power to you know, coach and a client? I mean, they're paying me, so I'm their servant in a way, you know, and I, I kind of need to put bread on the table. So I, I have an investment in sort of keeping it going. And I, I talk a lot to coaches about this, about, you know, how does that kind of shape your curiosity? How does it, you know, your, your need to earn a living and your need to keep this client? And, you know, do you become collusive with them? Do you, mm-hmm. do you kind of... Uh, like to seduce them and tell them how wonderful they are and stroke their egos. You know, like, you know, I do a lot of coaching supervision and, and we ask these questions. So exploring that. But I like to explore it in the room with a client, you know. So it's like, you know, sometimes a, a leader will find it difficult to take up um, the position of being client because shifting from being a chief executive to being a client, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that's a big shift, you know, and they, they walk from one office to another. So like where, where, where do you hold your coaching sessions? If you hold it in their office, it's more difficult to make that transition. And oh, yeah. But exploring that kind of relationship about like, you know, do they see me as Simon Weston, the great expert? And, and do they project onto me lots of kind of like uh, wisdom? Or do they uh, hold on to their power and they don't want to enter into kind of a curiosity? Mm-hmm. So I explore that with them. If, if, I, if I find them projecting onto me, kind of they want all the answers from me, I, I stop the session and I say, you know, what's going on here? Like, you know, you're, huh. you're treating me like I'm a wizard or some magical kind of being there with all the answers. I'm not like that. You know, does that happen in other, other parts of your life? Mm-hmm. You, look, do you know does, does that play out in other parts of your life or if they're very resistant and they're kind of holding onto the power arms and you'll find it very difficult to kind of do this work mm-hmm. right? like you know, yeah and then same on the other side as well uh that you know the, as a coach we need to ask ourselves questions well do i regard myself as this teacher or this expert or this experienced yeah. coach who's gonna solve this person's problems or am i feeling like oh what am i doing in this room this person is so successful what yeah. am i doing here that's right so and, and, and having that conversation in supervision and in the coaching session if you can actually be brave enough to have it in the coaching session you get some very great results because it's like uh you, you know i've shared with clients i, I said with clients like you know it's, it's interesting the last three clients i've been kind of very confident stuff with you i get anxious coming here and i, I know and i know it's because you're you know you're a powerful person and you, you've been running this company for a, a long time and and i think i think that this this kind of uh, experience I'm having is probably the same as a lot of your team members. And I don't think you're, they're, they're telling you what's really going on in your organization because they, mm-hmm. they're telling you what you want to hear, want to hear, hear what's being said. You know, they, 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 they're thinking it through to try and please you. So like you can use that experience, but you have to kind of be self-aware enough, enough to do it. So explore mm-hmm. the power dynamic in the, in the room, I, I think it's very helpful. And so that's oh, like yeah. one way I, I kind of use it. Yeah, I talked to Robin Shaw a couple of couple of months ago, um, who was working with that a lot, and he doesn't even find it to be courageous anymore to mm-hmm. share what he's picking up in the relationship or what's going on in his body or how he's feeling, and just bringing that in the space because it can feel to many coaches, especially when they're starting out, it can feel very daunting to sit with somebody and just share how you feel or something that's come up for you or something you observed in this relationship and how we're relating to each other, power dynamics, especially. And it is, I mean, you, you know, we shouldn't pretend it's easy. Like it takes many years of experience, I think to do it confidently and, and to sort of, uh, you know, I mean, a lot, a lot of coaches are trained as well to sort of carry around with them a coaching toolbox and, and like when they get anxious they jump into the coaching toolbox and pull out the, the next tool like you know so let, let's let's do this and let, let's do that as a way of showing their expertise as a way of kind of uh, validating themselves because they're you know they're, they're keen to show that they're they're worth the money you're paying them you know it's kind of there's this there's a whole industry around it there's a whole industry around coaching tools which kind of fit in the space in the yeah. car kind of view it's like an object petty R, so it covers a gap it covers where the anxiety is now but if you mm. can stay with the gap and do that work and, and understand kind of what what that anxiety is about to you and the client it's a much richer kind of conversation on that note do you do you use any tools um because I, I, there seems to be some methodology behind the the analytic uh, network practice that you that you train coaches in um it couldn't be called a tool, but also it could be. So I, I wonder if there's uh, if there's any tools that you use, and perhaps uh, as a good segue into uh, w- what is that that uh, approach that you're taking when you work with people. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. I, I started training coaches in in Lancaster. I was made director of coaching at Lancaster University, and uh, I started doing it without a methodology, trying to share my own experience as a coach and. Uh, and designed a course and uh, and it was, it was good, it was useful and we did some useful work, but I realized pretty soon that people do need some frameworks to hang things on. 
you know, mm. it, it is actually quite helpful. So being somebody who's against tools and against frameworks, it's quite difficult. But I did, I, I, I have designed a sort of a, a five frame way of working where we work through a depth analysis, where we look at the, um, the uh, inner self around kind of uh, your purpose, your desire, what is your desire, what is your purpose, and you know, there's so some kind of deep individual work. We move to a relational analysis where we think about kind of the outer self, about how you relate to others, how they relate to you, how they shape your life. Um, and, and that's kind of a, a kind of a, a relational piece of work. We then do leadership analysis. And, and for leadership analysis, I, I do have a questionnaire, like a profiling tool based on my book, um, which I use. And it's not it's not a psychometric and it's um, it, it's designed in particularly not to give you answers about yourself, but to kind of pose questions. So it's a heuristic tool. It's a way of kind of uh, opening up a conversation and mm -hmm. sharing a language for that conversation. It's very much like, you know, this is not kind of uh, telling you what kind of leader you are. It's about asking you questions about kind of mm -hmm. your perceptions around leadership. It's trying to kind of open up this dialogue. Um, so we use that. Uh, hold on, just, I just wanted to jump in there because I think it's such an important point. Um, because I had the same, I have lots of conversations around psychometrics and questionnaires and how they're being used in coaching. And I think in my experience, the best way to use them is as a start to a conversation. Yeah. Um, and I think when they're used very badly, they box people into categories and yeah. they're not presented very well. So I think it's just, it can be so helpful to work with a set of questions when they are a start to a conversation that helps somebody think about what kind of leader they are or how confident they are, how much meaning they have in their lives, how happy they are, whatever the questionnaire is about, there's a questionnaire for everything. And yeah. it's yeah. wonderful to use in coaching if you use it well. Yeah, and it has to be used like that. And, you know, like I I, uh, I don't use any psychometrics. I use this this profiling tool. And it's uh, one of the reasons I use it is because of the book I wrote on, on leadership talked about four discourses of leadership, controller, therapist, messiah, and eco-leadership over the past century. It's like my PhD research kind of shared up these four ways of thinking about leadership. And what I find is if you just talk about leadership directly, people have very, they have hidden assumptions around what leadership is. So they assume Nelson Mandela was a good leader. They assume, you know, Gandhi was a good leader. We have the kind of these, these ideas of charismatic messiah leaders. And I try and disrupt that idea about leadership. So it's like trying to broaden up their thinking about leadership and this profiling tool is a way of doing that they get a report and it says like you know you're not kind of just this or that your perceptions of leadership are all these four they're always got the four in there different weights to, to different kind of categories and then we explore kind of where that came from what that's about and it just gives a, a, a nice kind of way into, into kind of disrupting that idea of messiah top-down leadership and thinking about leadership differently so that, that's kind of why i use that so we have, the, we have the three frames and then we go into network analysis, which is really exploring kind of networks and systems of, of kind of a, how they influence you, how you can influence them, how change really takes place, power in systems. Um, so we take coaching away from the individual. We go through this kind of inner self, outer self, relational self, leadership, and then we think about the, uh, the client and the systems they work in. And then we develop a strategic frame where we think about strategies for personal development mm -hmm. and for changing kind of the work. So there's a framework there, but I always say to my coaches, like, like last night I was running a coaching session and people saying, but isn't that a bit prescriptive? And I'm like, it's not prescriptive because you, you can work with these frames, you can work through these frames in, in kind of a sequential way, or you can carry these frames behind you. Mm -hmm. And what they do, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're like an inner supervisor. Mm -hmm. but they, they stop you just getting trapped in one frame. You might be just, you might be very kind of uh, fond of the depth analysis frame. A lot of coaches are, they like to go to the soul guide coaching to kind of do, do that deep work. But you need the relational stuff. You need to kind of think about mm -hmm. power and leadership and authority. You need to think about networks and systems, particularly in the workplace where I work, you know. So it gives, it kind of broadens the, the coach's repertoire uh, capacity to kind of work mm -hmm. in, in different ways, rather than saying that you have to follow this tool or this methodology, like, you know, it's, it's a way of just to kind of educating coaches beyond the individual kind of uh, behavioral kind of, performance approaches yeah so there's a framework or a methodology or some tool even uh, even something like the grow model uh, can be so internalized that it's operating in the background and yeah. what happens in the coaching session feels like a very fluid human flowing conversation yeah. um, but actually you were you get curious about things that you hear or don't hear about based on what's in the back of your head and you get trapped in, in like, you know, you get trapped in ways of being. So you get trapped in, uh, unless you kind of uh, reflect on like these things, 
pull you out of uh, like a, a like a grow model would be goal focused or target focused. It pulls you out of that and and, and gives you a different kind of a way way into the the kind of systemic work. You know, like we never mm -hmm. start with targets or goals. Like this kind of not not what we do. I, I try and get people to kind of hesitate from that and ex and and do kind of um, some expl exploration first before they get to go towards strategizing kind of where they want to go. So it's a kind of diff different way of thinking, but you. Uh, unless you kind of do the work around relational or around kind of leadership, you know, you, you will get kind of a uh, trapped in just a cognitive behavioral kind of way of mm -hmm. performance way, because that's, that's how you got trained. So it's just broadening mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the uh, what I think coaching is. Yeah. And then in practice, how do you explore those networks, uh, those systems that people are in often nested, well, often always nested systems, but like uh, there seems to be something quite concrete around, well, who are the people that are important, who are stakeholders? I know I'm going to talk to Peter Hawkins, I think in a couple of weeks, uh, he always creates a mind map of stakeholders or brings them into empty chairs in the coaching room. Uh, I wonder how, how you do that kind of work to develop this systemic awareness. So in my coach training, we, we try and, broaden people's idea around systems and networks. You know, we work, we live in a network society. So I, I do a theoretical kind of talk around the network society, the digital age, how the ecosystems we live and work in are made up of people, technology, and the environment. You know, the, the, so I try and expand people's kind of uh, views beyond the stakeholder map, for example. Mm -hmm. um, stakeholder maps are, are important and useful but there's much more going on. There's, there's technologies and systems and networks. And the network world we live in is, is, uh, is quite different from kind of a bounded systems. You know, we, systems work is often about boundaries, authority, role, task. It's often about kind of groups, but networks are kind of more fluid and more kind of, they allow more innovation. They allow more kind of um, hidden power to, to kind of, uh, influence you know that there's a lot of hidden power in networks so mm -hmm. we we bring power into these, these mapping so we do network mapping exercise which i developed like a, a process where we do network mapping and we, we we have we have kind of symbols for power for close connections for for distance connections we kind of encourage people to think about technologies so is that is that pen and paper or what, what format yeah, is it yeah yeah always pen and paper because there, I, there's a lot of network mapping kind of ideas on on computers but that kind of that boxes you into kind of a, a kind of very small frame, and I, I, I use flip charts and kind of uh, pens and papers, and it's been hugely useful in my coaching kind of with with clients. And we get them to map their networks. We think about what's on the network, what they've missed out. We always think about you know, the Canyon lack and gaps. You know what's been missed out tells you a lot about what's what's the most important thing. <laughs> you oh, know? can can you give us an example in that? Yeah, I, I, I did network mapping with. Um, about 50 teachers and it was really interesting. I was doing a three day workshop on leadership with them and uh, we, we did a network mapping as part of that. And they all had their politics in there and they were mapping there. We map not just people, we map institutions. So they had the kind of regulation bodies and they had the headmaster and they had the, the board of directors and they, they did all this fantastic mapping and only three out of the 50 had put students on there. Mm. So, you know, we started, you know- like, Wow. <laughs> or what's lucky. And they got so caught up in the politics and allegiance stuff that they, they'd forgotten the kind of the most important kind of element, which is teachers. So so lack really shows off, shows up as a kind of, and the way people draw maps, there's often kind of like, I, I did one uh, the other day with somebody and I said, it's really, really interesting. It's, this map is so busy in that, that aspect and so busy there, you know, but there's a huge kind of empty piece of paper there. There's a huge lack and gap there. You know, what's that about? And that led, led this person on to really start thinking about kind of what they desire for themselves. We went back to depth knowledge, what they desire, what would like to be filled into that lack. And it's kind of a hole in their lives about their career. They've been disappointed about some things. And then um, and we looked about how they could kind of like uh, rediscover their desire mm -hmm. and kind of fill up that hole. So that, that's the sort of way we, we work it. Oh, wow, thank you. Uh, I'm sure we could go a lot of a lot deeper on that. In the interest of time, I, I do still want to talk about transformation with you. Uh, and in the context of everything you've just said, uh, oftentimes what we desire requires some form of change. Sometimes the change is, is at a level where we might talk about transformation, uh, but it's been defined in so many different ways. So I, I wonder what transformation means to you 
and uh, what role does coaching play in this kind of transformation? And perhaps from the angle of systemic change, what transformation is necessary uh, in leadership or otherwise um, that coaches can, can contribute to? Yeah, it's a difficult question for me because I, uh, I immediately sort of, uh, my, my critical theory background comes in, kicks in very quickly. Transformation is like a, <laughs> such an overused word in the uh, in organizational and coaching sphere that it's like I, I'm kind of put off by it because it's just it's just been so overused it's sort of uh, mm -hmm. on everyone's website on everyone's rhetoric and now we're, we're transformational what's a better word given that I, I think we know what we're talking about right well maybe not maybe we don't I mean I think this is, this is a problem I, I think it's used as a sort of umbrella as, as a cover for many different things um it sounds like an exciting word it sounds like it's sort of a uh, an energizing word but actually i think it's become very tired so you know mm -hmm. i think an individual coach would mean something very different to kind of a a social scientist or so i think it has mm -hmm. different different meanings i think like we have to kind of explore what we mean by it and um can i give you maybe a, a tighten the frame a little bit so that it's easier for you to to talk about it um when i hear transformation it's a it's a change of form right moving into a different form And that can happen for a person, that can happen for organization, that can happen for a system. Um, for me, it just speaks to, to change and change beyond a, a threshold where it's, it, you, could, you could argue that it changed form rather than just kind of remodeled or expanded a little bit. Yeah, I get it. And I guess, you know, I'm a radical in, in, in deep down. And I kind of uh, believe in, in transformation at that level. But there's something about the rhetoric around around workplace, around coaching, which is, for me, quite troubling because it sort of fetishizes change. It fetishizes kind of like a transformation as, as if kind of it's just we can all change forms. When, of course, there, there's also like other ideas we need to think about, like uh, continuity. There's, there's, you know, everyone wants to talk about change, but what about continuity? You know, what mm -hmm. about tradition? What about uh, some of the... the learning from the past rather than just thinking about the new in the future, the shiny new objects, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I like to um, critically think about these things and challenge these things and to think about, you know, what do we really desire? You know, mm -hmm. like if we always desire transformation and change all the time, you know, it's exhausting. Like, you know, the, there's a whole kind of, uh, re kind of world out there which demands that you change, you know? It's like mm -hmm. a, there's the society of commanded enjoyment, I call it. It's an Acadian kind of, Way of thinking. We moved from the society of prohibition in the 1950s, which said, "No, you can't change. You should kind of stay in your place, and you should know know your position. You should know your place in society." You know, mm -hmm. then move. So that was that was clearly kind of problematic. But mm -hmm. now we've gone to this society of commanded enjoyment, where like you have to transform yourself. You have to kind of whether you're doing some alternative therapy or whether you're kind of uh, selling for a company. You have to kind of go through growth. You have to do personal growth. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's this whole kind of happiness imperative which is creating a huge amount of depression, which is creating a huge amount of pressure on people. Another great article of yours, by the way. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I you know, I, I'm, I am a radical. I do really think that the world needs to change, but mm. we have to kind of uh, do it in a way which doesn't kind of, uh, it doesn't have a paradoxical effect, which just puts more pressure on ourselves to kind of be something which we, you know, there's, there's something about being uh, content with kind of what we have, who, how much we have there's something about kind of continuity with with the past which is you know valuing our valuing our elders like for me working with the elderly was such an important learning experience and i really think we've got this kind of apartheid between elderly people and kind of young people there's a whole yeah. gap you know and i just think we really need to kind of bridge these gaps and stuff so yeah so just to kind of play with these ideas is, is helpful i think yeah. Yeah, and I think that's so helpful to offer this critical perspective, uh, to ask those questions, to help a client who comes for coaching with this imperative in mind that, oh, I have to develop further and that's the desire to peel away, well, what, what is the desire about? Where does the desire come from? Do you want to change and transform or does it seem like something I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just by the uh, process, of offering somebody some questions and just really dive into the starting point of your journey coming into coaching uh, can be quite transformative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. 
No, that's right. So it's not it's not I'm not against it, of course, but it's just it's just really asking those questions at a different level of, and not just making the assumption that we're all kind of on this massive kind of change wheel and, and that's the only way to be. We have to kind of really think about kind of you know yeah. what we're content with and how we live our lives and kind of I mean for me it's you know the 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 uh, the purpose of analytic network coaching is it's sort of how to live a good life and how to create a good society. That's what we talk about on Edgy Ideas podcast you now. What does that mean for each of us individually and for us as a society? Yeah, it reminds me of one of the earliest clients I've worked with who, after six sessions, was still in the job that he hated and that he wanted to get out initially. But the change that had taken place, or dare I say the transformation that had taken place, is that he understood uh, why that was happening and that he had options uh, and then chose to not change uh, his circumstances, which was a huge change internally just not necessarily something you could observe in passing from the outside. Sure, sure. Mm. Yeah, and I really, really appreciate your your Edge Ideas podcast, by the way. I listened to a few episodes, one with uh, Tatiana Bakarova as well, um, where you just highlighted that that critical perspective. And we've already touched on how important that is and why it is important and how that could work. Uh, I wonder what you would tell coaches who feel uncomfortable challenging, criticizing, like offering critique or a critical perspective, um, it, it, it can be quite uncomfortable in the coaching space. And I think that's why a lot of coaches shy away from it, especially in, in this culture uh, in the UK. There's this shying away from making anybody feel uncomfortable. And it's certainly a trend I noticed uh, in the world as well. Uh, I wonder what, you'd, what you would tell uh, those coaches who struggle with that while perhaps appreciating that it's important and valuable. Yeah, so it, the word critical is, is problematic because it's uh, it's funny. When, when, I, when I published my first book, Leadership of Critical Text, they said at Sage, call it Leadership of Critical Text, but just know that because you've got critical in the title, it won't be a bestseller. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh. <laughs> I wish I changed the title. Like, but it's... it's um, Critical has has is thought of as something kind of negative or you know so so it's got this connotation, and I I am troubled by like uh, colleagues in the critical management critical organizational kind of uh, field because they do they're a bit like uh, again too attached to the wounded self they're a bit like mm-hmm. psychoanalysts they they, they 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 critique everything you know so in my books I I I usually divide my books into two parts my my coaching book is kind of part one kind of um, deconstructing leadership, really kind of critiquing it, trying to understand it at depth, putting it apart and trying to make sense of how it, how, how it, um, certain ideas emerge and certain practices emerge. And then the second part is really important to me is about kind of putting it back together. So reconstructing it. So I talk about the four discourses, I talk about eco-leadership, a new way of leading for the 21st century. And it's really to me to critique something is, is to, not going to get sucked into to, um, these taken for granted norms. You know, you mm-hmm. question kind of like you question what what uh, you have a kind of a questioning and a curious mind, and you and you don't just question it from a kind of a, an individualist perspective. You bring power into it, and you kind of try to understand what's really going on. You know, so we we talk about we go what is going on, and we go what is really going on. You know, it's like this depth perspective, and psychoanalysis is a part of that looking awry, looking differently at something is a part of that. Systemic power analysis is part of that, you know. But as a coach, I mean, for me, to do with the work, I, I, we, in our field, we talk about the work, you know, psychology, we talk about doing the work. And the work is, is about kind of um, being challenging, about, about really helping somebody through sort of uh, critiquing in themselves and, and understanding kind of uh, how they got, got into a place. And it's always something to do with systems. It's always something to do with power relationships, you know. Mm-hmm. And it is it, it, like, you know, it's, it's just, it, that is the work. It's like, you know, to, to, to do that work. And when you start doing that work with a the client, they realize that they're doing some work and they, and they want you to kind of continue that work. You know, it's like, a, it's very different from kind of band-aid coaching or kind of just making someone feel better, giving them nice positive strokes you suddenly get into a whole different kind of a way of being with them. And you realize mm-hmm. that there's something special is happening here and something important is happening here. Yeah, thank you. 
as we're moving towards the end of this, I, I have an edgy topic <laughs> that I'd love to uh, to see if you've had a stance on it, if you know about it. Um, you may or may not be aware of uh, the, the psychedelic renaissance. Uh, lots of research into psychedelics has reemerged uh, about, what, 10, 15 years ago now um, in its application in therapy. Given that you talk about the unconscious, you work with that, um, psychedelics are an incredibly powerful way to reveal the mind, to tap into the unconscious, to uh, get people facing stuff that they hadn't faced for a long time or kind of buried somewhere in the corner. Um, I wonder if you've come across that kind of stuff, if you have a position towards it, just because the potential and the application in coaching seems seems enormous and we're only just starting to explore the links between well-being and psychedelics, coaching and psychedelics. But so many people seek psychedelic experiences for growth, learning, insight, not just to treat and heal and fix things, not just the wound itself, but also to navigate forward and create ideas, be creative. Um, so, yeah, I just wondered, wondered about um, whether you've heard of it or whether you have a position. Um, yeah, I follow these things, so I kind of... Uh... I follow trends in society and like uh, psychedelics and um, are on the rise again. I think it's very, I think part, partly I think it's very interesting. I, I think, I think, I think in tree. So is terrifying sorry it? sorry simon you you were cutting out for a moment um could you just start over you i missed about the last 15 seconds yeah okay so psychedelics uh they've been around for a long time they've been um in traditional societies for many many years so i think we need to kind of uh, pull this apart I'm not a big fan of people flying out to Brazil and sort of, or, or, or some Amazonian kind of uh, cultures and, and taking psychedelics and sort of uh, with the fantasy that there's some sort of shaman who's going to, I think it kind of fetishizes kind of traditional cultures and stuff. And I, I think in traditional cultures, it has a place which is, you, you can't kind of uh, replicate by flying over there from a Western culture. I think we have just different mm -hmm. ways of understanding. So, I'm not a great fan of that. I think I think that's kind of uh, some idealization of, of kind of traditional cultures and, and some use. And I, I imagine people kind of, and I've read about people getting uh, in quite big problems as well. You know, I mean, psychedelics are problematic. They, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I did. You know, when I was younger, I did take magic mushrooms, like you know, so uh, once or twice. You know, experimental kind of. Uh, when I was working in the psychiatric uh, hospital, I had a friend who was interested. So we, we went out to the fields and picked some magic mushrooms and had an experience. And uh, and it was a very interesting experience. Like, you know, whether I don't think it changed my life, but it was like, um, it was an interesting experience, you know. So I, I have kind of experienced it. I, did, I, I also kind of experienced people who, who got into a lot of trouble, you know, with, with, with different drug taking. And I, I work with them as patients, you know. So there's, you know, there's a definite kind of problem there. But... I think in, in, in terms of like clinical depression and, and, and having worked with people in, who are clinically depressed and being close to people who are clinically depressed rather than just feeling sad or a bit low, you know, it's a terrible, terrible burden to carry. And I've, I've been reading about treatments for psychedelics, which are, are kind of quite a breakthrough for some of these patients mm -hmm. where you, you take a very controlled dose and then you get talking therapy alongside it and real support alongside it. So I think there are definite applications. I think it's interesting for us to explore how our minds work and our, and I'm a great fan of kind of uh, trying to understand our relationship to nature more, to the environment around us more. Mm -hmm. um, so natural, naturally kind of uh, nat natural elements in our lives. I think they, they've always played a part in our cultures. How we find that place in our culture today I think it's interesting and I think it's worth exploring, but not, not to try and fetishize kind of some kind of, yeah, some shamanic experience, which is mm -hmm. of another culture. I don't think you can kind of uh, cross those boundaries so easily. I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And it's so fascinating to observe at the moment how uh, some of the boundaries get more blurred and some of it straight up gets taken in, and embedded into a Western format. For example, uh, yeah. most of the psychedelic therapy um, happens in a hospital bed. 
You know, they, they try to make it a bit more comfy and cozy and kind of dim the lights and bring some decorations in. But yeah. essentially, it's a hospital bed yeah. uh, with two therapists next to your bed. It's a very different experience than, you know, going out into the woods with a friend. Yeah. Um, and all the retreat centers that are popping up in uh, in places where it's legal in Amsterdam, uh, around the Netherlands. Um, it, it's quite interesting to see how it's being uh, opened up to the desire of people to grow without necessarily diving deep into their pain, you know, because maybe the pain just isn't really there, um, but they're looking for a breakthrough in where they take their life or their business. Um, yeah. Or they're looking for a shortcut kind of without doing the kind of the real work, which is needed to kind of develop yourself. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's all, and there's, there's people who uh, administer these, these treatments or these experiences and some, I mean, we do know that people like to have power over other people, you know, therapists, counselors, coaches, um, that there's a, that there's a group of people who, who, um, maybe are doing this work, which who shouldn't be as well. So there's, there's oh, lots, yeah. of, lots of questions around it. Um, but I'm certainly not kind of a blanket against it. I think it's very interesting. And I, and I do think there, there's kind of a area to explore. And I, I think, uh, we, we should try and do it in a kind of responsible kind of, uh, way but absolutely yeah 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 and i appreciate that the conversations are now more out in the open and i think uh, the having the science to actually as a way into exploring this uh really opens something up because uh they're not just immediately oh these are tripping hippies uh, who are into psychedelics but they are serious serious scientists who explore the potential of what it can offer to human growth and development um and also to you know healing and uh, treating disorders so interesting to have the conversations out yeah. uh, when we are on episode 12 of uh, talking about coaching and psychedelics now uh, so it's it's nice to see to see the field expand uh, thank you thank you for your take on it uh, simon thank you for your time is there is there something else you wanted to tell coaches out there maybe encourage them to do uh, more of less of differently um Come on to my course. <laughs> <laughs> How can they find that? It's on uh, you'll find it on the ecoleadershipinstitute.org website and it's uh it's on events. So you we have a program running in October. Um but seriously, I say that because uh clearly uh it's nice to have people on my courses, but also because it takes the uh the coach on the journey, which I think is important, and that's about really thinking about kind of ethical perspectives, systemic perspectives, but in a very practical way. I mean, my, my course is very much about kind of how do you do this in practice? And we do mm. a lot of coaching practice and stuff, and it's uh, drawn from experience of working across the globe using these methods. So I think coaches have to really shift from sort of performance-based target-focused coaching into kind of a, a more, almost like a fourth wave of coaching really where we, we see ourselves as systemic practitioners we're part of wider systems we're part of uh, the environment we're part of uh, social change and i i think you know we have to kind of get engaged with that so that's that's what i'd like to share with people yeah fantastic simon thank you so much uh, lovely conversation Yannick. thank you for having me i appreciate it well see you again <laughs> ciao bye bye Thanks for listening to Coaching Uncaged. If you want to find out more about becoming a coach, developing your coaching skills further, or training as a coaching supervisor, then head along to animascoaching.com. Thanks again and catch you on the next episode.